We're so glad you've joined us online today, and uh, we are very excited about the weeks ahead because we know that soon, one week soon, we're going to be gathering together again, re-engaging as a congregation in our buildings for a time of corporate worship and a time of fellowship and being in the Word and all those things that we normally do every single week. Uh, but we're not quite ready to name that date just yet. We're watching, we're praying, uh, we're listening. And uh, as you well know, in about uh, just a few days, we'll hear from uh, the governor about where the trend lines are for the coronavirus. And we want to be responsible. Uh, there are many churches in our area that are coordinating together for a key date. And so we're looking at that date and uh, we will be very ready on that date. And I'll be announcing that in the days ahead, not just yet, but in the days ahead. In the meantime, I'm very pleased with our online content, very pleased with the number of people that are joining with us, and I hope that you'll invite others to join with us as we go week by week through the Word and various times during the week uh, from different ministers on our church uh, to be able to bring content to you. It's been great. It's been a great time, but I'm rested. I know you're rested. I'm, I'm ready. I know you're ready, and, uh, and soon we'll be back together. So today, we continue with our series and our series is called Wish I Knew. And today's subject is Family is Forever. So grab your Bible, whoever you're with, uh, go into another room. If you need to get that Bible out of the other room, lift up your uh, iPad, tablet, or your phone and turn to the book of Ruth today. Ruth is in the first section of the Bible. Um, look for Joshua, Judges, and then Ruth. It's a very short book. But man, it is a powerful book when it comes to the principle we're looking at today which is Family is Forever. Now, I wish our, our new series uh, is based on the question, what truths do you wish you'd known all along that would have changed the course of your life? And many are the answers. Something better exists is what we started with. That is, the resurrection means that there's some life beyond the grave. In fact, it's a better life. Something better exists than what we have now. Uh, isn't that encouraging at times to know that something better exists? The next week, we looked at truth still truth. There is absolute truth. Jesus defines that. And we can know what the truth is, especially when we know him. Then we looked at relationships are real and the value of relationships and what they mean to us. And then last week, forgiveness brings freedom. And we had great interaction with people over that subject. Forgiveness brings freedom. And many of you found freedom last week as you literally applied the principles Jesus called us to. Now today, family is forever. Let that sink in for just a moment. I wish I'd always known what a big deal having other family members are. I wish I'd always valued time with them, <laughs> relating to them, walking with them through life. I wish everyone knew how God can use our commitment to family to bring blessing to life. So today it's a kind of a unique and complex story that we're going to tell, just like a family story. It's filled with famine, hardship, death, Tough decisions, separation, loneliness, and solitude. Now, none of those things sound good to me, but they're real. And it ends with a surprise blessing. Naomi, the star of this particular book, is an Israelite woman whose family fled to Moab to escape famine. It was a tough time. While there, she and her husband have two sons. Within a very short period of time, the sons married, the husband dies, and afterward, tragically, the sons die, leaving Naomi with two daughters-in-law and no means of support. What comes to mind when I read the first part of this story in the book of Ruth is the old line, life is tough and then you die. Sometimes it seems that way. People are kind of feeling that today. We're sheltering in, virus is spreading, economy's faltering, people are struggling, life is tough. We can identify somewhat with Naomi, even though she lives in a very different era. But in this story, she's heard that God has a blessing in Israel, and food is part of that blessing. So she makes the decision to return to Israel from the land of the Moabites. And there we pick up the moment of decision. Now I'm going to go to Ruth chapter 1 and begin reading in verse 8. Ruth chapter 1, verse 8. What a great line I'm about to read here. Scripture says, And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-laws, Go, return each of you to her mother's house, and may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Now there's a line that kind of gives the uh, aroma of what, what it's like right there, the aura, the atmosphere. You've dealt with the dead, and you've dealt with me. Verse 9, May the Lord grant that each of you find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? 
Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters, go, for I too am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope that I should also have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? <laughs> would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. So she's hurting here. Verse 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Now, Ruth is a key character in this book. When she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Now, listen to these words. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to go back from leaving you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. And when she, that is Naomi, had seen that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. And uh, as you read that text, you realize the difficulty in that time frame and all that they were facing. And so let's get into the story for just a few moments and see what the Word says for us today about family is forever. First of all, in this text, you're going to find a decision for family and faith. Ruth is the one that made the decision after her sister had gone back to their parents. Ruth said, where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. This is a huge vow, a profound and a moving decision that this young woman made. These words are often used in wedding ceremonies because of their beauty. It's a poetic phrase, deeply affecting anyone who hears, and especially to a poor, destitute, desperate Naomi. Can you imagine how loving and how reassuring that commitment sounded to Naomi? You know, powerful words are a gift and can give life to others. I want to encourage you, realize that, use them to build each other up. So part of this decision involves the family decision. This daughter-in-law is not necessarily thinking of the term family, but certainly had her mother-in-law, Naomi, in mind. She was saying, I'm deciding to be with you. I'm leaving all others for you. Now, they're related by marriage, but she's also making a choice to love well. It's how family works. It's why Jesus gave us important commands to love one another. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this than when lay down his life for his friends. Jesus taught agape love, which is unconditionally influenced choices to seek the best for others. We now define Christian love as that agape love. And by the way, looking at this whole story, good relationships, good family relationships are a choice we make in life. And it's above all personal. I'm of the opinion that everyone needs to feel this kind of decision and this kind of statement needs to be heard by them. I'm dedicated to you, is what Ruth said to Naomi. I've chosen to love you. Every successful marriage has this. Every good family dynamic has this. It's a choice. Choose. This is a great point for what I call wishy-washy families who are on the fence. To make a decision for family and communicate that. The part of this decision is not just the family decision, but it's also the faith decision. Ruth made a broader statement in saying, your people are my people. Your God is my God. Now keep the context in mind. This is a Moabite woman raised to worship Kamash, the God of the Moabites. And yet here she says, I'm committed to you and your God. Naomi's life helped Ruth see the value of worshiping Jehovah God. And this moment of decision, while family, was also a spiritual one. This is her conversion moment. Most commentators say this is the moment she made the choice to follow the God of Israel. She's leaving an old life for a new one, an old God for a new eternal one. The Bible consistently urges families to be on the same page spiritually, just like this young woman was becoming on the same page spiritually, to be equally yoked is the scripture's admonition, not unequally yoked in marriage. Scriptures always prioritize the critical element of being united spiritually. It's still true. Remember, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, Do not be bound together with an unbeliever for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness. That's in 2 Corinthians 6. Family life is hard enough without spiritual 
commonality to God. The old triangle illustration applies to any relationship. We draw closer to each other when we draw closer to God. And it forms the shape of a triangle. I'm here, you're here, and as we both get closer to God, we draw closer to each other. And so in this story, the witness of Naomi encourages us to be a witness and lead the way in faith, to keep faith commitment strong. There is a direct correlation between who we worship and the health of our family relationships. Keep that in mind. And one of the most important questions to ask yourself is this one. Have I made it clear that my faith is in God and that I'm trusting Christ for my salvation and my daily walk? That ought to be a question you talk about in the room. Why or why not have I made this clear? And are you willing to make a faith commitment to Christ? If it's clear to you that you're a believer in Christ, do other families know this faith decision that you've made? Then there's another principle that I want us to see today. Not only this decision, but a determination. This is a determination to the end. And here's what she says. She says, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you and me. The first line is beautiful. The second line is radical. It's the equivalent of a throat slash sign. I'm burning the ship, she says. No going back. I'm all in. I will never renege on this commitment. You can count on me no matter what. That's what Ruth is saying to Naomi. And it sounds so radical because we're not used to this kind of determination in relationships today. Ruth has determined that her relationship with Naomi is more important than her personal welfare. I think it would have been much more sensical for her to stay in Moab, back in her father's house, looking for a new husband and a new way of life. What she's doing is risky, but she's radical in her devotion to Naomi. It doesn't completely make sense, but the commitment is clear, and we're surprised by it. Today, we're more likely to hear, I'll stay so long as you're nice to me, so long as I feel valued, so long as I can pursue my dreams, or as long as things go well, I'm in it. Today, you're more likely to hear others say about such a commitment as Ruth made, well, that's admirable, but let me know how that works out for you. But not Ruth. She is deeply dedicated no matter what the outcome is going to be. She doesn't know, but she's going to do it. She went into the relationship knowing that it was more important to love and be loved than anything else life can offer. Relationships are more important than achievements. Friendships and family are forever. I want to pause and ask you to let that sink in for just a few moments. As a matter of fact, If you're in the room with family members, take a moment and glance at them and see if they've seen that statement the way you've seen that statement because that's such an important commitment to make. Sadly, some learn this after it's too late to build or restore those relationships. And so as your pastor, I want to say to you, value your family, value your relationships and your friendships. Pay attention to those closest to you and work through the toughest challenges in them. Self-sacrifice is essentially what commitment means. My wife Kim and I freely share that in our own marriage, it would have crumbled just a few years into it had we not had this kind of commitment. We'd agreed early on never to talk about divorce. We'd agreed early on to stick with it no matter what. And then years later, I can recall sitting around a dinner table with our children and making this kind of statement to them so they would know our commitment to each other and to them. And it brought great security to them to hear me say, I will never leave your mother. I will never abandon you, my children. Countless are the times when conflict and disappointment and discouragement would keep us from maintaining family ties with all of our family members if we're not willing to be completely dedicated. It's just life. Above all, I want my family to know I'm in it to the end. And you should want that same thing. I'd go anywhere to help them in any way, to rescue them, to love them. They are forever to me. And let me add this. Not everyone will have family members that are sympathetic to being connected in this way. Some may want to be left alone. Some have chosen adversarial ways to live. But you can be dedicated to loving them anyway. Love them through it. Love them despite all else. Just like Christ loves you. Here's a great question. What is your commitment to family members? What are you doing to make sure family is forever valued in your heart and in your life? Now, since many of us are gathering around family members today, take the opportunity to say, 
I love you. I'm here for you. I'll never leave you. In fact, this may be the best moment to put the message on pause and to look at each other and do that very thing or have a great conversation like it at the end. So we've looked at the hard work of making your family a forever family in the Book of Ruth. But there's a side of the story that shows surprising and accelerating blessing. And this is what I call the discovery of the blessing. Now they're in Bethlehem in Israel. And it's time to find their future, to be able to eat and make a home. Since it happens to be the time of the harvest, Naomi sends Ruth into the field of Boaz, which is a relative of her late husband, and there they find an amazing blessing. Everyone's looking for a blessing in their lives. And when you're following after God, there are many of them. In Ruth's story, blessing unfolds for them in several ways. First of all, let me point out that character brings blessing. In chapter 2, Ruth finds Boaz in the field and secures permission to reap grain for food. And notes to Ruth, Boaz recognizes her and in that small community is aware of the story of how Naomi and Ruth arrived in Bethlehem. So Boaz treats her so well that Ruth has to ask, why have I found favor in your sight? Listen to the answer he gives her. He says, all that you've done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been fully reported to me and how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. That's in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. In other words, Boaz said, I've been watching you from a distance and I see character and commitment and it's impressive. I want to open the doors of provision for you and Naomi. So her character brought blessing. If we were to interview Ruth at this point, the talk is going to be about just surviving. She's living in tough times, but it doesn't keep her from doing the right thing with her family or in expressing and demonstrating integrity and loyalty and kindness. We see this throughout her time in the spotlight, in this brief time in the Bible in the book of Ruth. You've got to admire people who do the right thing, who treat others well, who look out for those around them, even when nobody else may see it. But others, on the other hand, could see it. And in this case, Boaz knew of her reputation. Unselfish commitment and loyalty to others will eventually open the doors for blessing. At the very least, it brings respect and intentions of goodwill from others because this kind of character stands out in a world of bad attitudes. Now, this may be a sensitive question for you today, but it's a good one. If you dare ask it, ask this. In what ways does your life open doors? or close doors to blessing through your character. What would others say is your greatest characteristic? Your weakest. Relationship brings blessings as well. At this point, the focus swings from surviving now to thriving in the future. Ruth's character is evident to outsiders, but it's more obvious to the insider who has seen it all, Naomi, than anyone else. Naomi is blessed by their relationship, not just the character, and is blessed by the commitment Ruth exhibits. And now she wants to ensure that Ruth thrives in the future. So here's what the scripture says as we look in uh, Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. Very short verse that says a lot. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? The word security in the text has to do with settling down. I want you to have a final home. I want you to not be a wanderer. I want you to have roots. You gave up everything to come with me, and I want to see that you're taken care of now. So Naomi is thinking that Boaz might be a fitting husband for Ruth, and being an Israelite understands the conditions that already exist for this to happen if Boaz is at the same mind. So she gives instructions for how Ruth is to present herself, hoping and praying that the match can be made. So Naomi has become a matchmaker at this moment for Ruth, and the reasons are many. Ruth has shown character, commitment, dedication. She's left her people and her God in order to embrace Jehovah, the one true God of Israel. Ruth has loved Naomi, and it's in everyone's best interest to secure her future. But don't miss this glaring point. Ruth has lived in such a loyal, relational way that her life has opened doors for blessing instead of closed doors for blessing. We already saw how Boaz saw it. Now Naomi is demonstrating that. You know, those closest to us know us at our best and not at our worst. Our family knows me at my best and my worst. 
But like Ruth, we're called to high character and commitment in front of those closest to us. Family life can be tough because there's a level of security there. It's not like we're going to be gone tomorrow necessarily. But why would we test the boundaries by behaving poorly and neglecting the relationship that's closest to us? But here's something else. Naomi is doing all she can to care for the one who cared for her. When I'm gone, Naomi says, I want to have given you every opportunity and I want you to have been settled and to have a home and have a future. What a blessing. And finally, God brought blessing. Not only the character of Ruth and not only the relationship, but also God himself. As I often say, the stories of Scripture are so powerful and so thrilling, someone needs to make a movie of each of them. This one is no exception. The book of Ruth moves these characters and us from surviving now to thriving in the future and to this whole new level. Boaz decides to marry Ruth. And chapter 4 is a story in itself. Read it sometime. Here's the conclusion of the story. The scripture says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. That's chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Now, while Ruth's character and commitment to the relationship with Naomi brought great blessings and opened many doors, the ultimate blessing came, where else? From God himself, who moved Boaz's heart to take these women to his family. The women called it, well, they named it, Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a redeemer today. Boaz is here called the kinsman redeemer, and it's yet another picture of the gospel. You have a hopeless widow, and daughter-in-law who are deeply committed to each other but have no future, and they themselves have little to offer anyone else. According to Jewish tradition, if someone were to claim Naomi as a relative, they also acquired Ruth and the responsibility to care for and provide a place for both of their futures. While Boaz already had his family, he already had a heart as well for these two, and he took action to buy or redeem them both, accepting whatever blessings or obligation they brought with them and they all became one. He rescued them and made them his own. I love this picture because it so clearly shows us how Christ has done the same thing for us. He sees us in our need. We're helpless to pull ourselves up alone. We kneel at his feet. He sees us, has pity on us, accepts us, and cares for us all the days of our lives and even beyond. Christ is in every way our rescuer. Contemporary Christian singer Lauren Daigle has a song named Rescue. It has a powerful way of reminding us of the distance God will go to rescue us. And he did that with Naomi and Ruth. Here are the words of that song. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. I will never stop marching to reach you in the middle of the hardest fight. It's true, I will rescue you. The book of Ruth shows a glimpse of the Savior that's to come, our Redeemer, Christ, who purchases us with his own blood and by his own mercy. And if you need rescue today, God is there to do it. Will you let him rescue you? You know, there's some great lessons from the life of Ruth and the book of Ruth, and here are four of them very quickly. Number one, commit to your family for life. The stronger is your commitment, the deeper the foundation you build on. Make a commitment to your family. Number two, resist all pressure to break the relationship. This is not an if statement. It's the reality that pressures will come. Be ready to resist pressure and pull together instead of being driven apart. Number three, adopt your additional family members. Whether we're talking about spouses, immediate family members, or extended family members, adopt them and love them unconditionally. This does not give anyone permission to use or abuse you. It simply says, I'm recognizing the forever nature of the family. And then number four, know God is a witness to and cares for your family health. It's very clear as we read the Bible that God designed the family long before any other human institution. He honors those who respect the family. Now for an amazing capstone to the story. In Ruth chapter 4, verse 17, we read that Ruth has had a child by Boaz, and Scripture says, So they named him Obed, and he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Ruth was brought into the line of Jesse, David, 
And if you know your Bible, Jesus, the true dreamer of the world. You know, there's a Holy Spirit moment here that I want you to take where you're asking him to show you what you need to do for your family or about your family. Let him lead you. Let him lead you to make the statements that we've talked about today. Let him lead you to make the commitments that are important and necessary. Let him lead you to get all on the same page, spiritually speaking, so you can walk together as a spiritual unit of a family. You know, two weeks ago we heard about a great story that took place. And it took place in a family that was watching online as Kent Wells went through the message, uh, Relationships Are Real. That's the story of a son who was there watching uh, with the rest of the family, but who decided to make a spiritual commitment so they could all become one together because he needed to do it and it was time. The rest of the family was a part of that conversation and saw an incredible moment of decision, both family and spiritual. And maybe that's what needs to take place today in your life. All over the place and the hundreds and thousands of homes of Cross City Church members and the many, many others who are watching today it's an opportunity for you to make the decisions that are so important in life. To commit yourself to Christ first, then to your family, and to your family's welfare. If you've never put your faith in Christ, I want to encourage you to make that decision today. First and foremost, it's always a priority. Recognize that you need a Redeemer, someone who will pay for your sins and give you the gift of eternal life and take care of you eternally. Someone who will lead you and guide you as Jesus promises to do as the Great Shepherd. I come to the place of saying, I give you my life. I surrender the future, and I trust you to save me and to put my family in a position where we can be successful and have your blessing. If you've never made that decision, I want to encourage you to pray with me right now. This prayer of spiritual decision. Join me as we pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for what Christ has done on the cross as my Redeemer. Thank you for the price he paid to take care of my sins and to offer me the gift of eternal life. Today, I turn away from my sin and everything else and put my trust and faith in Jesus alone. I ask that you give me this gift, forgive me my sins, and give me eternal life, and help me begin this spiritual journey that will change everything about me. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for joining us today. There's a place for you to click on your screen to help you know how we can take next steps with you. So thank you so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you again soon. You know, when I was preparing for full-time ministry, I remember one of my professors said that relationship should always be above all programs. And these programs could be our jobs, our career, our hobbies, sports, entertainment. And it makes sense because uh, programs comes and goes, but relationship or people are eternal. And so in a thing, time like now with COVID-19, one thing that we can learn is that definitely uh, all these activities can come to an end just like that. And yet it is the important relationship that we have that holds us together. And this is why it's so important that uh, we take time right now to have a discussion with one another openly about what we just heard about relationship. And to help you process that, we're gonna put some questions on the screen in a few moments that you can pause your video. And now we're gonna pray for you that the Holy Spirit will lead you in your discussion so that you can ha really have a very meaningful uh, open discussion with that. So once again, we wanna thank you for joining our online service today. We wanna wish all the mothers again, happy Mother's Day. And we look forward to see you again next week. But until then, stay safe and God bless you.